Um, historically, in the U.S., and the same is basically true in most of the rest of the world, um, spectrum was allocated for terrestrial broadcast of television. Um, before the days of cable and, and satellite, obviously everybody got their TV over the air. And in the U.S., there were basically uh, up to channel 69 originally, which was allocated for television broadcast. But in the course of the last few years, uh, culminating in June last year, the U.S. went through what was called the digital transition, where television stations went from an analog broadcast format to digital. And the rest of the world is essentially going through a similar process as we speak. But as a result of that transition, a couple of things happened that are pertinent to what we're talking about today. The first was that um, it gave the government a chance to sort of juggle the TV stations around a little bit and free up some spectrum at the top end of that um, band. And they actually auctioned that spectrum off in, in 2008 in what was called the 700 megahertz auction. Um, the TV stations were compressed down into then essentially what exists today, channels 2 through 51. Um, and amongst that space, though, or, or those channel spacings, they don't use the whole of that channel allocation. And so the leftover space, which we'll go into in a minute, is really what's defined as TV white space. Um, essentially what the government has done is made it available on an unlicensed basis um, to all of us. And its appeal is twofold. One, that it is more spectrum um, that is available for unlicensed operations. And in simple terms, that's like sort of being at, able to add a couple of lanes to the highway. Um, and secondarily, because of the type of spectrum involved, it has physical properties that give it certain characteristics that um, give us options in terms of what spectrum to use and how we use it. And I'll talk briefly about that in a couple of minutes. So in the next slide, uh, what you'll see is an example of what white space really is. Um, this picture shows you uh, the northeast U.S. and the sort of pinkish red circles as they came out on the screen are service areas for a single television station, Channel 9. And as you can see from this chart, it clearly shows you that uh, in much of the area of the northeast, Channel 9 is actually not being used. And that is literally the white space for Channel 9. So under the basic rules as they've been defined, one of these new devices uh, cannot operate in channel 9 uh, anywhere under those um, pinkish dots, but can operate, subject to certain other rules, in pretty much everywhere else. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's a pretty substantial amount of spectrum. Um, the other key there is that obviously as you go around the country um, and you overlay the channels, then just because if I'm in an area where that pink dot exists today I, and I can't use channel 9, it is possible that channel 10 or 11 or 12 may be available for me to use. And so what you pull that all up together, which the next slide shows, um, is a map of white space over the whole country. Now I caution you a little bit on this slide because it's very easy to take this data and, and to um, uh, use it in, in as, as all statistics in ways that are not necessarily particularly accurate. But this map actually is a county by county basis. So it was created using the center point of a county. And as you go into the Midwest, some of those counties are pretty big. So you have to be a little careful. And the second thing to be careful of here is that this chart shows you all the available white space. So in a case where it's, it, you effectively have to multiply by 6 megahertz, uh, given that each channel is a 6 megahertz channel, uh, that shows you that, in effect, there is white space available all over the country. And in many places, there's a significant amount of white space. But the fact that there is a large amount of white space doesn't by itself mean that you, uh, with a particular device, can use um, all of that white space. Within the rules, the FCC had to allow for a variety of different uh, constituencies to use this spectrum not least of which being the television stations that own the licenses to broadcast, uh, but also secondary users like cable head ends and users like wireless microphones. And last but not least, um, there are different classes of white space devices. And because of the way the rules are written, um, not all spectrum is available to all devices. So it's very important that you look at a specific location and bear in mind the type of device that you would be looking to operate to determine how much white space um, is available. 
but suffice to say that even in the major metropolitan areas, um, there is a, a, a significant amount of white space in the order of sort of probably 30 megahertz or more available that has been reserved for the secondary users like wireless microphones. And likewise, for particularly low-powered uh, white space devices, there's probably a minimum of 30 megahertz for them in these major metro areas. And obviously, in the rural areas, uh, even more than that. So um, with that one caveat, we'll sort of move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about what what's new about white space um, in the sense of why is this different from the way spectrum has typically been allocated. And the key here is you need to understand how the FCC has allocated spectrum in the past. And, and it, generally speaking, they clear a band uh, nationwide and make that available for a certain kind of service. Uh, it may be sub-partitioned into licenses for different groups, but it's generally cleared. And that the ISM band, which is where we use our Wi-Fi devices today, is a good example. No matter where I go in the country, that Wi-Fi band is the same. Um, as many of you are probably aware, we've had a huge increase in demand and the prediction for an even greater demand of bandwidth um, for iPhones and all these other wonderful devices we're running around with. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of places left for the FCC to clear an entire band. And, and even if they go about it, it can take a, a, a substantial amount of time. Uh, we're talking years uh, in order to do that. So in the case of white space, what they did was they didn't try to clear the band. They accepted that it was being used, and they tried to find a way to share it. And the way they went about that was to create an, an environment, in this case, where it's a secondary use by unlicensed devices, uh, provided that those devices can verify the availability of spectrum in a given location with a database. Um, it's not actually unique in that we've actually at Spectrum Bridge created a similar database for the outdoor 5 gigahertz solutions, uh, which until recently were precluded from operating because of a potential to interfere, to interfere with terminal Doppler weather radar. Um, and they're relatively critical pieces of equipment, so obviously that was a serious issue. Um, but by use, creating a database which knows where those terminal Doppler weather radar are and can figure out how much of an offset in terms of frequency or location is necessary before you can safely operate, that band has now been opened up and has, in fact, opened up about 300 megahertz of spectrum for unlicensed outdoor uh, fixed devices. So it is our expectation that this kind of concept will be more necessary, um, and, and this white space, uh, TV white space, is a great uh, starting point uh, to get this kind of technology uh, proven. Today, the FCC rules um, in terms of uh, how this should get used are at the forefront of what's going on around the world. Um, but I think it's fairly uh, safe to say that most regulators around the world have been following very closely what the FCC has done. And you can probably expect to see similar kinds of um, announcements from, from other regulators going forward. So in the next slide, we'll skip uh, quickly to some sort of uh, summary, uh, one or two slides that summarize um, what the um, uh, the space is all about. Um, we're going slow here, why not move forward? There we go, that's better. So um, when they were producing the, the rules, the, the uh, commission cited several examples of trials that I see Spectrum Bridge in, in partnership with a lot of other folks had put together. Um, on this slide, they're, they're all what is classified as high-power uh, solutions. The, uh, going back to my warning about the use of white space, the, there are two, loosely two groups, distinct groups of devices in terms of how these rules can get used. Um, what, one is the, um, uh, the, the utilization of what is called high-power devices. So they are uh, generally used for outdoor wide area deployments. And the other is for um, indoor uh, utilization in an office or a home environment where they're very low power devices like you would see in a laptop or an iPhone. Um, so in this slide, we talk specifically about the high power devices. Um, in the case of, of uh, Plumas, California, um, it was used for smart grid applications where a local utility was leveraging this to do broadband applications for um, uh, 
uh, monitoring the equipment that provides the, the electric utility to the businesses and consumers, and also provided in uh, using partnership with Google that provided third-party applications and, and equipment to let actually the consumers of, of the electric utility monitor the, the um, use of, of that um, and, and to be able to figure out how much electricity they were using. Um, over in Logan, Ohio was a telemedicine kind of application. Um, very uh, similar in the sense of a wide, wide area outdoor application, but in a community setting. Um, in this case, the hospital was sort of the center of a, a campus-like environment that stretched around town with a variety of doctor's offices and outpatient facilities and medical transport that were all pulled together into that application. Um, Claudeville, Virginia was strictly a, a provision of wireless broadband. Um, while it was set up as an experiment, was set up to show how a WISP, a wireless internet service provider, could use white space to provide broadband to unserved areas. And lastly but not least, Wilmington, North Carolina, which coincidentally was where they did the first digital uh, TV transition, um, uses the availability of, of, of broadband access now to um, help the city run efficiently. Um, they call it a smart city, but it's actually connecting in a variety of different applications related to water quality monitoring and evacuation route monitoring and turning lights on and off on ballparks and other kinds of things that they do. So these are all based on what it, that they call the high-powered um, uh, use of the rules. And, and in clarification, um, in terms of how this seems it will get rolled out, um, it is an unlicensed uh, use, and so it uh, doesn't require a special permit or license for you to set up and operate a network as an individual or as a, a, an enterprise. Um, and the industry is anticipating, at least initially, that these white space radios will be based on an existing technology like Wi-Fi or WiMAX. Um, the, the argument being that they're existing and therefore the cost and the time to uh, enhance them to work in this new spec spectrum band with these new rules will be relatively straightforward. Um, but I, I wouldn't preclude the fact that um, other people may come up with new technologies um, and new applications above and beyond these kinds of capabilities. So that's an example of some of the high-powered applications. And in the next slide, um, we'll go to what, what has generally been called and probably unfairly Wi-Fi on steroids. Um, but the idea here is that white space is available and has been permitted such that these very low power devices, again, radios that you might typically find in a wireless printer or a laptop or any other device at home, um, can leverage TV white space um, to, to improve on things. And the idea behind that is any number of uh, consumer electronics, uh, cordless phones or other kinds of, of um, devices will be able to leverage TV white space. So moving on to sort of some of the reasons as to why, um, in, in those high power examples, the, the reality of the physics, um, it, white space is lower frequency spectrum than the kind of spectrum that is typically used by, say, wireless internet service providers today. Um, and so they, they can see an improved coverage over what they can do today. These lower frequency are better suited to sort of propagation through trees and they tend to bend a little bit around or over hills. And so overall, this sort of coverage for a, an access point or a base station is, is better than the existing alternative and therefore should be more cost effective for, for them to deploy. In the indoor environment, the, the sort of same physics works in two ways to help. Um, first, if you've used all of your uh, Wi-Fi bandwidth at 2.4, then obviously this gives you more spectrum, i.e. more bandwidth to, to use. So that's the equivalent of adding a lane or two to the highway. Um, but equally, um, because of the better propagation through walls, um, the expectation is from the experiments that companies like Microsoft and Dell have done that you will actually find there are fewer black holes in your office or your home and that you will actually be able to get not only full home coverage, but it will probably also work on the patio or in the, the, the sort of the back 